This is Chapter 2 of Hattie Big Sky by Kirby Larson. January 1918 on the Great Northern Railway, somewhere in North Dakota. Dear Charlie, the first night on the train, I couldn't sleep for my excitement. The third night, I couldn't sleep for the smell and the din. I can hear you saying that my train ride is nothing compared to your travels overseas. That's true as true, but I'm cross, hungry, and grimy, so I will have my fuss. The book Miss Simpson gave me does not hold my interest. It speaks of work, work, work. I'd rather read the railroad pamphlets, which make homesteading sound as easy as rubbing a magic lamp. I know there is no genie out there, ready to do my bidding. That is why a hundred questions bubble up inside me. What shall I do first when I arrive? What is entailed in proving up? What if I can't do it? My mind whirs at the thought of all that must be done. Aunt Ivy would be as pleased as Mr. Whiskers with a mouthful of feathers to know I am in such a muddle. I'm afraid I will have to rely on that painful teacher experience until I get my homestead legs. I looked up from the letter I was writing to Charlie and turned my attention outward. The view from the grimy railcar window was most discouraging. The pamphlet says Montana's the land of milk and honey, I wrote, but you'd never guess from this endless stretch of snow. I'm sure it's different around Uncle Chester's claim. I wondered again about my uncle. I had heard of him, of course, but not much, and had never met him. He called himself a scoundrel. What did that mean? What had taken him to Montana? It seemed to me that Uncle Chester's heart could not have been all that dark if he remembered a niece he scarcely knew in his will. I trust you've enough of your mother's backbone, he'd written. I sat up straighter. I had no idea if I had my mother's strength. I knew little more about her than I did about this long-lost uncle. That didn't stop me from imagining her, perhaps even looking down on me now. What would she say? Would she side with Aunt Ivy or approve of my decision? I wondered, as I had so many times, if it would have been easier to lose my parents when I was still a baby, with no knowledge of them at all. The memories I had now were frustratingly faint, whispers of the past. From the one photo I had of them, I knew I'd inherited my father's straight nose and my mother's crooked smile. In what other ways they had made their marks upon me, I had no way of knowing. But surely, agreeing to move to Montana, to Uncle Chester's claim, showed some familial gumption. Meow! Mr. Whiskers wiggled in his case. You poor puss. I checked Mother's watch, pinned to my bodice. You'll be a free cat soon. The train would arrive in Wolf Point in less time than it'd take bread dough to rise. I shifted on the seat trying to discreetly rearrange the folds of my skirt under a very tired rump. The fat man across from me had been snoring loudly, but my movements woke him. I quickly turned my face to the window again. It does make a heart glad to see such country, don't it? he asked. I mumbled a polite response. Where are you headed? He leaned forward puffing out breath, soured with stale tobacco smoke and whiskey. A washboard fin cowboy, slouched in the next seat over, chimed in. She'd be headed to Helena. That's where all the young ladies aim for. Despite Aunt Ivy's constant warnings not to talk to strangers, here in the tight community of the Great Northern Railway car, it seemed bad manners not to answer. I'm going to my uncle's homestead in Vita, I answered, near Circle. The fat man hooted and slapped his thigh. Child, that's near nothing, absolutely nothing, he shook his head. Hanyaker, the cowboy mumbled. 
He tugged his greasy hat farther down on his head. I beg your pardon? Hanyaker, hayseed, squatter, it's all the same. The cowboy wielded a wicked-looking knife to pare a chaw of tobacco off the hunk in his hand. Fool farmers think they can make a go of it out here. The fat man swiped his forehead with a grimy handkerchief. M- my uncle has a lovely farm. I adjusted my new hat. B- bumper crops this past year. I cringed a little at my lie. But then I didn't know that Uncle Chester hadn't had bumper crops. Gold darn railroads. The cowboy spat toward the brass spittoon in the aisle and nearly made it. The sight made my stomach threaten mutiny. Bet he got suckered by them railroad pamphlets, didn't he? The fat man shook his head. Thought he'd plow up gold coins instead of turnips. My uncle's farm is quite... Flustered, I couldn't come up with the word I wanted. Bountiful. The fat man exploded with such an exceedingly indelicate phrase that my stomach lurched. Blast him, he continued. Him and all them greedy, conniving railroad men making promises Montana can't deliver. His voice pummeled me with its force. Now all the passengers were nodding and murmuring agreement with this dirty cowboy and red-faced fat man. The only one keeping his own counsel was a man in a dark overcoat. My tongue tingled with choice words for these rude men. I clutched my lunch basket closer and reminded myself that a lady should also keep her own counsel. Aunt Ivy had branded that message on my bare legs countless times. Wolf Point! All out for Wolf Point! The conductor stuck his head in the car. Miss, here's your station. The train slowed, but the fat man's tirade did not. In fact, he reminded me of Reverend Porter at the last tent revival, proud of his three-hour orations. I tried to shut him out as I gathered my things. Starving to death. Ain't got the sense when to quit, he rattled. If you was my daughter... At that moment, the train lurched. I tottered in the aisle, desperate to preserve my balance and my dignity, as well as a grip on my bags and my cat. A lady can only bear so much. It had been a long, miserable trip. My patience was as frayed as my second best dress. Sir, if I were your daughter, I said, looking him full in the face, I would wait until this train started up again and throw myself in front of it. The car fell into stunned silence. Then the cowboy hooted. Look like she's told you a thing or two, Chet. Voice quivering, I managed to say, Good day, gentlemen. As I passed through the doorway, a man's hand grabbed my arm. I beg your pardon? I already regretted my outburst. Now I was probably going to be killed for it. Aunt Ivy had warned me a hundred times about the wild men out west. I looked down and saw that the hand belonged to the quiet man in the dark top coat. Blame their manners on bad whiskey, he tipped his hat. May I say, miss, that I have utmost confidence in your success in this hard land. Thank you. I willed my legs to stop shaking. They did not obey. But my uncle does have a going concern. I'm sure he does, the man said softly. Sure he does. He stepped back inside the car. I made my way to the corridor and off the railroad car on legs weakened by more than fatigue and anger. It didn't help that Charlie's face appeared before me, awakening memories of his kind and tender ways. Awash in self-pity, I even longed for Aunt Ivy. At least I knew what to expect of her. I thought I'd known what to expect of Montana— that here a person could not only have dreams, but could hold them, and they wouldn't shatter. Now I wasn't sure. I turned around, half thinking to jump back on the train. Good luck, miss. The conductor swung my trunk down, and welcome to Montana.